नमस्कार आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट एन इशू दैट कंसर्न्स द पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ द कॉन्टिन्यूड एग्जिस्टेंस ऑफ इंडियन सिविलाइजेशन एज वी नो इट ओवर द नेक्स्ट से कपल ऑफ सेंचुरीज द डेटा व्हाट आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक टू यू अबाउट इज डेटा नंबर्स एंड दिस नंबर्स are mainly from what the census has collected from 1880 onwards uh, the kind of uh, subject that i'm presenting to you is called religious demography demography as most of you know is the quantitative study of human populations demography essentially is the science of numbers it is in mostly quantitative but though the subject is quantitative the science is quantitative it concerns both the quantitative aspects of a population as well as qualitative aspects of a population quantitative aspects are the number of people uh, their fertility rates their mortality rates their literacy rates gender ratios these are the quantitative aspects of a of a population and then there are qualitative aspects their economic status but most importantly with the demographers are often concerned about is the distribution of a population amongst various ethnic social religious linguistic groups and this is one of the most important aspects of demography because this determines to a large extent the history of a of a group of a population in a region it determines law and order situation it determines uh, how do you administer uh, and in india this question of particularly distribution of a population amongst various religious groups has been extremely important for for the period, all the period that we know but certainly the last 200 years for which we have or little less than that for which we have census data available as we know india got partition in the middle of the 20th century and the only reason for that partition there was only one single reason for that partition and it was that the religious demography of the indian subcontinent had changed in a particular manner in certain parts of india there is absolutely no other reason for the partition of india and not only india has suffered that fate in the world wherever demog religious demography of a region has changed sharply it has often led to partitions it has often led to wars civil wars external wars local disturbances it happens all the time It happens all the time, and that is why it is extremely important to study, continuously study, religious demography of every population, where the other social groups are important. Other other demographies have to be studied. For America, for example, ethnic distribution of populations is extremely important today. They are so terribly concerned about this issue that how the American population, its linguistic nature and ethnic nature. is changing over the last 3 uh, or 4 decades it has drastically changed and it raises issues about the continued con existence of america as a nation as the, that nation is known till today and people get concerned people try to change things that is why that's why because demography is important it is said and this is augustus comte a french philosopher of 19th century who said the demography is destiny demography is indeed destiny uh, not only for human populations is also destiny for non human populations for animals also it's extremely important their numbers are important and those those who do not care about their numbers are bound for extinction it happens all the time it happens all the time and the data that i going to present to you today 
seems to indicate, seems to indicate that uh, for us, the situation as it has been developing over the last couple of centuries is such that if things do not change, uh, that extinction will be a strong term to use, but perhaps we are heading towards the direction. I have a, I have a very senior scholar, philosopher, uh, his friend, he saw the data we had collected in our, our books. And he called me. It's very difficult for him to read. He reads with a big, big lens. And he called me. He told me, Bajaj, it normally takes a civilization about 500 years to, for it to be reduced to extinction, reduced to a level where no trace of its ideas and institutions survives. And then he told me, from the data that you have presented, 300 years of our civilization are over. And it was not a light statement. It was not a light statement. And that there's a history to that figure of 500 years. That is the time it took for the Islamic civilization to completely erase all traces, though it has not yet happened, but largely erase the traces of the Iranian civilization, which was very high. So that is the kind of situation. We are at a state where a very senior, serious philosopher of history can tell us that 300 years of our civilization are over. And that is for the all of India. For parts of India, we are much farther on the direction. The parts which have separated from India in the middle of 20th century, for them, it is not the question of 300 years, another 200 years. For them, the 500 years seem to be over, unless we do something about it. And several other parts of India seem to re be reaching that state that another 50 years, another 100 years, and as we go along, I'll show you, there are very many parts of India as, as this divided India of today. Within that, there are very many parts where um, if I must, may use the term Hindus, uh, the original carriers of the ideas and institutions of the civilization cannot live anymore. They can't live in Kashmiri Valley, Kashmiri Valley part. They cannot live in most parts of Northeast India. It's very difficult for them to live in Kanyakumari. It's very difficult for them to live in parts of Kerala. And there, this I'll show you the data. Uh, they, they, it's extremely difficult for them to live in parts of Assam. In fact, perhaps it is impossible. This is the data I wanted to present to you today. <coughs> I'm sorry that the picture is depressing, but let me, before I continue, normally demographers make their predictions, make their projections with the understanding that when they are making their projections, that projection becomes an input into the dynamics of that society. And because it becomes an input, the projection that they are making, they make it with the hope that the society will not let it come true. And it has happened again and again. In Europe, I think in the 20s or 30s, there was much worry amongst the demographers that the population of Europe relative to other parts of the world was coming down. And different projections were made that by 1950, much of Europe uh, will become a small part of the world in terms of population. <coughs> Those projections led to a situation where people raise their fertility rates, people increase the number of children they produce, and 1950 did not see the kind of projections which were made in 1920. Again, about 10 years ago, there was much talk in various parts of the world 
that Europe is getting depopulized, depopulated. In fact, there was a famous phrase in The Economist that large parts of Germany are being reclaimed by the wolves. Wolf is an important uh, animal of, of Europe. They think they have, they have recovered uh, the parts of Europe for human use from the wolves. And they're worried, they were worried that much part of Europe, many parts of Europe, are going to go back to the wolves. And within 10 years, in those parts of America, of Europe, where the fertility rates had come down much below the replacement rate of 2.2, 2.2 children per, per woman, within 10 years, the situation changed. And when I saw the data last time, they were saying that the reason for this change was that those women who had completed their family chose to have one more child. That is how societies react to demographic projections. Societies react to demographic projections. They can react with despondence, which is my experience till, since we have been presenting this data. I, I am told later that this is very depressing. Uh, you are only spreading despondence. That is one way of reacting. But most societies, most dynamic societies, react to this type of information not with despondence, but with resolution. And why I am presenting this data is in the hope that we, we react with resolution and not with despondence. Uh, before I come to the data proper, I want you to look at this, uh, this map of India that I am placing before you. All, all science, especially in India, is done in context, in the context of time and space. Demography has always to be understood in the context of geography. And geography is almost as important as demography. Uh, geography decides how, how civilizations are, are formed, how, in which directions they move. They decide on the, on, it decides on their longevity. And India is very special in, in, in terms of its geography. If you look at this map, in this map of the world, India looks clearly as a separate, distinct part of the world. In the north, there is this huge wall of Himalayas, which separates it from any other part of the world. And most of history, for most of history, it has been impossible for people to penetrate through this wall. There have been some some passes in the northwest from which invaders used to, used to come. But these passes are so few and so high that for most of the Indian civilizational experience, India has been able to defend those passes. From the northeast, there are some lower parts from where there could be a possibility of people coming from outside. But northeast ruins so heavily that there's no way anybody can pass through that. So there is this huge wall of Himalayas which separates India from the rest of the world so thoroughly that it is most of history it has been almost difficult, almost impossible for outsiders to enter India. And if you look below, in the south, east and west, there is this large ocean which stretches over thousands of miles before any major land masses encountered. So it was, though we are taught all kinds of things in our school books, but the fact is that for most of history, and for India history is extremely long, for most of a long civilizational experience, it has been nearly impossible from, for the outsiders to come into India. That's why when Alexander came into India, one of the reasons, his, his uh, historians who came with him, they record that 
Alexander is great because he is perhaps the first person to have entered India. That is how entering into India was thought of. That's how entering into India was thought of. So, India is a geographically formed like a fortress. In fact, there is somebody who has said, I don't remember the quote, but what they're saying is that India is in the form of an island with the dimensions of a subcontinent. That is how geographers tend to define India. And that is one part of Indian geography. Sometime I'd like to talk to you only about geography of India because, uh, because it is extremely important the kind of geography we have been presented. Uh, the one important part of India in the context of what I'm presenting to you today of the geography of India is it's the nature of India as a natural fortress. And the other important part is that between the Himalayas and the, and the sea, this vast landmass is extremely uniform. Through, throughout this landmass, the surface rises very rarely about, about 3,000 feet. Nothing, in fact, today we were talking that it, when it uh, snows in the Himalayas, when it snows in Shimla, when it snows in Samba, you can feel the cold wave right up to south. It is that, that flat a landmass. It's that uniform a landmass. And it's very rare, it's very rare in the world to have that kind of flat, such vast flat landmass. It's extremely rare. And uh, this landmass, for various reasons, for the for climate, for fertility, for the number of rivers we have, is extremely fertile, highly fertile. In fact, in India, uh, as this uh, map shows, it is possible to cultivate 50% of the geographic area in almost every part of India. It's possible to cultivate at least 50% of the geographic area, which is very rare. In the world, you do not have this large land masses where 50% is, is cultivated or cultivable. And in India, because there is sunshine throughout the year, this 50% becomes 100% because almost everywhere you can grow two crops in a year. This, again, is very, very rare in the world. Most places you are able to grow sunshine is so little for so little part of the year that you cannot grow more than one crop in the year. So India is uniform and that is why there's nothing, there's no part of India which can be called hinterland. All of India is the India of this civilization. All of India is the core area of Indian civilization. It is not that this part is in the core of Indian civilization, the rest of the hinterland. There is no such part in India which can be called the core and the rest is hinterland. Every part of India is the core area of Indian civilization. This has consequences. This, should, this nature of India should affect our thinking in various ways. The way we plan, the way we engage with the environment, all, should be deter all this should be determined by this. We should know that there is no part of India where human civilization, Indian civilization, has not flourished and expressed itself in great grandeur. Because of this uniformity of the Indian land mass, one of the consequences of this has been that a single civilizational milo has pervaded every part of India over, over millennia. In this rich land, Indians have evolved what they call Sanatan Dharma, what we call Sanatan Dharma, a, a comprehensive system of thought and action which is not, doesn't belong to one single part of India. It pervades everywhere. We may have different language, we have somewhat different clothing, we may have somewhat different cuisine, 
Though even that is not very different from one part of the India to the other part of India. Even the language is not very different from one. Vocabulary is the same almost everywhere. Grammar is also very similar almost everywhere. And, and this uh, uniformity of Indian landmass, Indian ideas, Indian institutions has been noticed by most foreigners who came into India. Uh, the latest perhaps is this Kingsley Davis, who is important to quote him because he pr can be called the first modern demographer of India. In 1951, he wrote a book where he says, Indian ideas and institutions taken as a whole resemble those of no other people. They have a peculiar shape and flavor, flavor of their own. They have tended to transform and absorb any foreign elements that tricked in, trickled into the region. For India, though politically conquered by outsiders, was never culturally conquered. It is a demographer of 1951 who is saying this. We don't teach this to our students. This peculiar culture has to some degree penetrated and pervaded nearly every part of what is geographically India. It has everywhere been affected by local indigenous variations, but neither the geographical nor the social barriers inside the subcontinent have been sufficient to prevent the widespread diffusion of a common basic culture, which despite great variations is peculiar to India. A foreigner can see this. In fact, because we live here, we will not see this. That's a different issue. Because when, when you don't notice similarities, you notice differences. But when an outsider comes, for him, differences everywhere, he will notice the similarities. In fact, we should also be sensitive to these similarities that, that run from northernmost parts of India to the southernmost parts of India to the easternmost, to the westernmost. India is Indian. The people, the way people think, the way people live, the way people eat in India, and the way people express themselves, the way they relate with nature, the way they relate with the higher truth, what we call the greater uh, essence of the world, of the universe, all of them behave, react, act, relate in the same manner. And this is important about India. Uh, this is what has always defined India, civilization of India. India has always, Indian continent has always had a certain homogeneity about it. Everything, there may be different ways of manifestation, everything seems to have arisen from the same core of thoughts and ideas and institutions, which is defined as Sanatana Dharma, which collectively is called Snatan Dharma. Those few foreigners who were able to cross into India in the course of history were almost always, as Kingsley Davis is saying, absorbed into this homogeneous milieu of India. Many of them, many of these invaders, so called, became great devotees of Snatan Dharma. They great, became great Vaishnavas when they came, they lived in India for a while. But nobody remained separate till, till, till the Islamic invaders came to India. And this can be said with great certainty that till the coming of the Islamic people into India as rulers, till then India was a homogeneous, not only geographically homogeneous, politically homogeneous landmass, it was also culturally, socially, religiously homogeneous civilization. Islamic people perhaps are the first people who came into India and uh, resolutely decided, resolutely decided that they will not get absorbed into this great cultural mill of India. They will resolutely decided that they will remain distinctly separate from the civilizational ethos of India. In fact, I go to the villages of, of Madhya Pradesh, several of them. And everywhere, even wherever there are, uh, Madhya Pradesh of course doesn't have very many Muslims, 
But everywhere where they are Muslims, they have a separate, distinctly separate location. And uh, the same philosopher, historic friend of mine, when I told him this, he says, it is not that we have ghettoized the Muslims. And he is a great student of Islam. He said, it's not that we have ghettoized Muslims. They have chosen to remain in ghettos. They have chosen to remain separate. It's not that we have separate them. We did not separate anyone. Everybody got absorbed. It is they who have resolutely chosen to remain separate and the resolution remains to this day. This was the first, first source of heterogeneity into the Indian civilization. The second source came with the British, who of course, there were some Christians in India before, they were very similar to us, and it's very difficult to make out uh, where Syrian Christ how Syrian Christians are different from the rest of Malayali Melo in which they live. But the British, they brought of course Christianity, but more than that, I think much more than Christianity, what they did was they emphasized heterogeneity of India over the all-pervading homogeneity. They created doubts in our minds about the truth of Indian ways and being, about the efficacy of Indian ways and being, and they, they dug up all kinds of heterogeneities, the caste heterogeneity, the linguist heterogeneity, the all kinds of heterogeneities, which became, these heterogeneity became part of our popular discourse, they became part of our political consciousness, and they, the British, this, in this manner, created the next level of heterogeneity into India. Till the British, I don't think, into India was this heterogeneous, this Aryan, Dravid, this North Indian, South Indians, Easterns, uh, Westerns. I don't think Indians thought like that before that. Obviously, people are different in such wide, vast landmass, there will be differences. But what was noticeable was what was common amongst them. And instead of emphasizing, emphasizing the commonality, the British taught us to celebrate the differences, to, uh, to highlight the differences, which we keep doing all the time. Our textbooks do, our politicians do this, our administrators do this, our newspapers, day in and day out, they only talk about differences of India. Polit Manifestors of political parties, who are supposedly highly nationalist, insistent, insist on writing as their first sentence that India is a conglomerate of different religions, different languages, different uh, people, different races. India is not a conglomerate. India is a nation. India is a civilization. And it is an integrated, homogeneous civilization, except for the heterogeneities which have been introduced in the recent times into this landmass. We have, in a way, are trying to measure the homogeneity. I think I have taken too much time in this uh, introduction. But let me now give you the data. What has happened to this homogeneous India? Uh, this, this table that I am presenting before you concerns not the Indian Union of today, but all of India. What is the geographic civilization India, uh, uh, which includes Pakistan and Bangladesh. If you look at this, in 1881, this, I have made this terms Muslims, Christians, and Indian religionists are all others who are not Muslims or Christians. Most of this, 96% of these Indian religionists are Hindus. They are perhaps 2.2% Sikhs, there are few Jains, but Sikhs and Jains are not heterogeneous religions. They are, if anything, if anything, they are more believing, more assertive, more aggressive, not with, about the Jains, but Jains will be more, more practicing uh, Snatan Dharma people than uh, other. So this uh, uh, Indian religionists, Muslim, Christians, if divide the population into these three large groups, then in 1881, there was 79% in this landmass, there was 79% Indian religionists. 
there were about 20% Muslims and very few Christians. In 2001, there are 67% Indian religionists, 30% Muslims, and about 2% Christians according to the official count. So, in about 120 years, the mainstream people of India, their proportion of demographic presence in the Indian region has come down from 79 to 67, 12 percentage points of decline. Muslims have correspondingly increased by about 10 percentage points. Christians, according to the official count, have increased by about 2 percentage points. If you don't take the official count, if you take the Christian count, the way they count themselves, then this 2 percent is 6 percent actually. Uh, and it is not uh, that I am saying this, this is the Christian encyclopedia that will say that actually there are 6 percent Christians in India, not 2 percent in India. So, this decline of 12 percentage points according to the official figures and about 16 percentage points according to the more realistic figures in the share of the mainstream religion of the, a, a compact landmass like India, this is not a small thing to happen. In a century, if this happens, this is extraordinary. And it has extraordinary consequences, one of which we have seen, the partition of India. But it can have more consequences because this is a, this is a very large variation from coming down. In fact, if I have to put it in perspective, at the time of Akbar, it is said that uh, in that part of India which came under the Mughal rule, which came under the rule of the Mughals, there were not more than one-sixth Muslims. And they, of course, there were hardly any Christians. So at the worst, in the 400, by the time of Akbar, the Muslims had been ruling for about 400 years. In that four centuries, we had lost about 16%. In the one century of the modern period, in this 120 years, we have lost our share by 12 percent. So this is much larger, much larger than what happened when the Muslims were actually ruling here. Uh, this itself, I think this thought should remain with us, that in the, in the last 120 years, our, the, our is not the issue, the share of the people who are supposedly the carriers of Indian civilization, who are responsible for Indian civilization, their share in the Indian geographic region has come down by 12 percentage points. And we have done this small mathematical calculation. If you look, I have 12 data, data points. I make a simple regression and uh, try, to fit, try to achieve the best fit uh, it shows that if the trends of the last 120 years are continuing, or like do continue over the next 50 years, then by about 2061, in the Indian region, I'm not saying Indian Union, Indian region, which is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh put together, the share of Muslims and Christians will be more than 50 percent, and the share of Indian religionists will be less than 50 percent. In, not in far future, but in the next 40 years or something like that. In fact, when we made this graph, we were abused. And uh, we were told that these people, they are physicists, they don't know what demography is about. And uh, they don't know how demographic calculations are done. This is not the way things happen. Uh, this is crazy. And I, the, one of the answers I gave was that this we had done in, on the basis of uh, population figures up to 1991, 2001 data had not re been released. I said, let 2001 data is going to come. Let's see where that, that point falls on this figure. And 2001 data came, the point uh, that uh, the next point on this figure was exactly where we had projected it. And now the 2011 data will come, perhaps in another one year, perhaps after the elections. Right now, perhaps there will be uh, reluctant to give us this figure. And I can tell you for sure, if the situation will be worse, not better than what, what we see on this graph. So, in, in fact, Mr. Satcher in his report, 
takes note of this graph. And he says that some people are saying that India will become less than 50% Hindu, that they, uh, they lose the majority. And he doesn't say that this is not going to happen. He says, how does it matter that who is a majority or minority in India? This is the official statement from a high-powered uh, committee set up by the government of India which, that had access to extraordinary material. And he makes this blatant statement. How does it matter who is a majority in India and who is a minority in India? To Mr. Sachar it may not matter. To us perhaps also it doesn't matter. But for the continuation of Indian civilization, it matters. And the Indian civilization is important. As, as the, since we are born in this country, it is our, should be our commitment that we leave this, leave this world uh, with Indian civilization somewhat more secure than when, when it was when we were born here. To such a it may not matter, to us it should matter. And it always matters. It, always, it matters to Europeans of today, to this generation, that Europe has been, European civilization has been be holding the hegemony of the world for last 500 years. It matters to the present civilization, and they say it in so many words, there is our duty that we leave this civilization secure in its hegemony for the next generation. And one generation can do only this much, that it leaves it secure for the next generation. And if we cannot do that much, then I think we have failed in our duty. And I don't think we are right now in a position to do that much. Uh, that was whole of India. Uh, if I look at these three parts into which India has been divided separately, that in Indian Union, uh, Indian religion is today are about 80, today means 2001, about 84 percent. They were about 87 percent in 1901. The ratio had gone up to 87 percent after partition when this large movement and killing of populations occurred. That 3% increase that had occurred because of that, that tragic event, that has been all neutralized in the course of the next, next four decades. Pakistan had about 16% Indian religionists in 1901. It had about 20% in 1941. After that partition, there was hardly any Indian religionists left here. There were about 2%, they remain about that. But their living there is meaningless. They live as slaves. And we all of us know it. And there's a information about this everywhere. There's no place in, in, in Pakistan for Indian ideas or institutions. There's no place in Pakistan for anybody believing in Hinduism. That, let's be very sure. In Bangladesh, there were about 34% Indian religionists at the beginning of the century. They, after partition, the expulsions of Hindus there from there was not as thorough as it was in the, after that every decade, there has been continuous expulsion, continuous forceful expulsion of the Hindus from Bangladesh. And they are not 10%. I can tell you for sure, if it were not Bangladesh, it didn't concern India, it concerned any other part of the world. This, the number of people in three decades, their share being reduced in a small region like Bangladesh from 30% to 10% will be the news of the world every day. Because people don't leave their homes for fun. They don't leave their homes out of volition. They have to be expelled. And that's what is happening. That's what People know about it, everybody knows about it, but this is one thing that doesn't get whispered in, in the, either, neither in the Indian newspapers nor in the, in the newspapers of the world. And uh, we can be sure, we can be sure that maybe another 20 years, uh, Bangladesh, in terms of religious demography, will be like Pakistan. It will not be. Uh, perhaps the contiguous areas about, of Bangladesh, like Assam, like parts of Northeast, 
will also be like, be like Pakistan. In fact, some of them, as I'll show you, have become like Pakistan. Uh, this uh, uh, shows the rates of growth of different communities over the post-partition period. As you can see, the in 1991-2001, Hindus have grown by 20%, Indian religions have grown by 20%, Muslims have grown by 30%. Difference of, hmm? in rates of growth, there is a difference of 10 percentage points. The rate of growth of Muslims is nearly half more than that of Indian. The situation was not this bad in 1951. The difference was there, but the difference was of, of about 15 percent between the rate of growth of the Indian religion is and the and the Muslims. As the India has taken to the idea of lowering its population, the Hindu rates, Indian religious rates of growth are coming down. There's some decrease in the Muslim rates of growth also, but the gap between the two is becoming only wider. It has widened from about 10% difference to about half, to about 50% difference. And this kind of differences, of course, will continue. This is not a minor difference. This will continue to uh, increase the pressure on the share of Indian religionists in different parts of India. Uh, if you look at the fertility rates of Muslims and uh, the Indian religionists, uh, Muslims uh, have about 19 children according to 2001 population in uh, 100, among, in 100 people that, 100 Muslims that 20 children, uh, 19 children. The Indian average is less than 16. So there's a gap of 3 children per 100 population. And this gap can be as wide as 7 or 8. In Assam, in Haryana, in Uttaranchal, in West Bengal, in Chandigarh, in these regions, the gap between the number of children per 100 Muslim population and the number of children per 100 Indian religious population can be as wide as seven children. That is the kind of difference. That is the, and this is then you see the way the share of Muslims is rising in Haryana, the share of Muslims is rising in uh, uh, Assam, that's directly reflected there. Uh, if I look merely from the point of view of religious demography, India can be divided into three large regions. India can be divided into three vast regions. There's this vast, uh, wide, uh, wide region, uh, which I am calling region one. This is generally the region uh, growth in a, where Indian religionists continue to dominate, continue to dominate, their proportion is everywhere above 85 percent in these states. These are the states of Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Gujarat, Odisha, and uh, uh, below that Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and uh, Tamil Nadu. In this region, which is nearly 57% of the population of India, uh, Indian religion, 57% of the population, India, this Indian religionists tend to dominate even today. Though, as I'll show you, there are pockets where their numbers are coming under great pressure. Then there is this region two shown in in green. This is the region where. The, this is uh, Uttaranchal, what was called Uttar Pradesh earlier before it was divided. Then there's Bihar, then there's West Bengal, Bihar and now Jharkhand also, then there's West Bengal and the Assam. This is Ganga Brahmaputra belt. This is the most fertile part of India. This is I think 19% of the area of India. And 38% of the population of India lives in this region because after all, it's the, it's the plains of Ganga and plains of Brahmaputra where you can do as much agriculture as you wish. You can grow as much food as you wish. There are really no constraints either of water or of fertility in this area. In this area, everywhere the ratio of Muslims, proportion of Indian religionists is below 85%, turns from 65 
to 85 percent. And everywhere the ratio is quickly declining. And then there are these red regions on the borders of India. There's the Kashmir in the north. There are these northeastern states in the far east. And in south there is this Kerala on the coast. There's Andamans below. There's Goa. There's Lakshadweep. All these red regions, everywhere Indian religionists are in a minority already. If the partition were to happen today, it happened in 1947, it happened according to the ratio of different people in, the, in those geographic regions. If it were to happen today, this will not be part of India. All these red regions will not be, because the partition line was drawn, the census data was picked up, and it was drawn on the basis of what was the proportion of Muslims and others. There was no other criteria put. And if today that line was to be drawn, uh, these parts will not be part of India. These are places, and there, there the proportion, as I will show you, there the proportion of Indian religion is, is declining very, very sharply. Uh, this is it, region one. Uh, as you can see, everywhere Indian religionists are above 90. Uh, above 85 percent in the northern parts, it's almost 98 percent. Uh, in the southern parts, it is nearer 90 percent. Uh, the red, where I mark this, uh, uh, the proportion in red, this is the proportions in 2001. Where I mark this in red, those are the states where between 1991 and 2001, the proportion of Indian religions has declined by about one percentage point, which is not, not a small decline in this region. Uh, though overall in this region, Indian religions dominate, there are various pockets, and let me quickly recall these pockets. In the north, uh, in Himachal Pradesh, there is this region of Chamba, which borders on the dark end and Kashmir. There, uh, Muslims form, may form now a sufficient uh, presence and very quickly their, their proportion rising. 1991-2001 data was a surprise as to what is happening there. Below that in Punjab, there is this region of Sangrur, particularly Maler Kotla. That was the place where the Muslims were not expelled from Maler Kotla because the Maler Kotla Nawab uh, had supported the sons of Sri Gur Govind Singh, when they were to be, he had raised his voice against their killing in the Sarin court. Because of that, that uh, reason, they were given protection by the Sikhs at the time of partition, so they stayed there. But their numbers are rising very fast compared to from every, every decade they are rising fast. But not only Sangarur, Punjab because of its peculiar uh, way of doing agriculture requires very large amount of labor from outside. And since the labor is coming from outside, many regions now where there were no Muslims after partition are getting substantial presence of Muslims. A district like Ludhiana has, in 2001 had 2% uh, had Muslims. So you could not think of such a thing happening. And uh, uh, there's a village near Chandigarh where a Muslim was elected the Sarpanch. So that's the way uh, in parts of Punjab, which as a consequence of partition, no Muslims were left. In there also the Muslims are acquiring a new foothold and is a deep foothold in various regions, even regions of Malwa where it was completely unexpected. Below that is the Mewat region, uh, Gurgaon of Haryana, which now has been split into uh, several districts. And out of the several districts, one Muslim majority district of Mewat has been carved out. Mewat is, I think, about 75% Muslim. And this we do continuously. Wherever we see that there is a significant Muslim or Christian presence in any one pocket of some area, we, I don't know, out of some some desire of self-destruction, 
we decide to give them a separate administrative unit. We have done it in Mewat, we have done in Kandamal and Gajbati, and we do it almost intentionally. We give them separate states. We have given Jharkhand, and I will show you, uh, after the separation of Jharkhand, the presence of Muslims and Christians has risen much faster than, when it was, than what it was rising when it was not separated. So the same thing is happening in Uttaranchal. We, we almost in a self-destructive fashion rearrange the administrative units to favor Muslim and Christian minorities. We do it systematically, continuously, and Mewat is a prime example. In, I have lived in Mewat for a while, and uh, it is impossible to live as a Hindu there. Almost, the whole milo is different. Uh, the streets look, look different. The food being sold on the footpaths is different. Then, uh, but Haryana, because, partly because of Mewat, but even otherwise, the proportion of Muslims is now about 5% in Haryana. And it's been rising very fast. And uh, adjoining Mewat, there are other adjoining Mewat of Haryana. There is Alwar, Bharatpur region of, of Rajasthan, which is also a Mev region. And Alwar, Bharatpur are the districts uh, where the Muslim presence has been growing very fast for the last 40 years. In fact, when I looked at 2011 data, Mewat and uh, Mewat rate of growth, we do not have the Muslim rate of growth right now, but we have the total rate of growth. Rate of growth of Mewat is nearly double the rate of growth of the rest of Haryana. Similarly, in Kerala, the rate of growth of Muslim majority district of Mallapuram is somewhat more than double of the rest of uh, rest of Kerala. There's the kind of differences you see. Below Mewat, uh, as you come below, from Burhanpur of Madhya Pradesh, in the central India, uh, you go below and there's the Maratwara region of, of Maharashtra, and below that is the northwestern uh, region of Andhra Pradesh, which we are going to carve into Telangana soon. And adjoining that is the uh, North Karnataka region of Gulbarga. This is a belt of Muslim, significant Muslim presence, where continuously Muslims are rising. Here also we separated Akola to ensure that the presence in Akola of Muslims should be much more in the remaining part than what it was in the larger Akola. Further south, in uh, and the coastal Karnataka, the whole bed, Dakshin Karnataka, Karnataka, Kodugu, Udupi, that region, the Muslim and also partly Christian presence is rising very fast. That is the Muslim, and then these yellow spots that I have shown, they are uh, the pockets of Christian influence. In the west, there is the Dans district of, of uh, Gujarat, where Christians were rising very fast. I hope something has been done to change that situation, but it's rising very fast. Uh, it's a small district, very small district. The dance uh, is hardly 2 lakh people or 3 lakh people. Then in the east, in, uh, in Odisha, from Sundargarh below Fulbani and up to the coast, there's a belt. Uh, I'll show you another map where you can see this belt developing. Or very, very systematically. Where the Christian presence has been rising, there has been a Christian presence, it has been rising and going southwards. Clear, develop, a separate, clear belt is developing there. And that is the region where we have separated uh, Fulbani, we have split into Gajpati and Gandamal. Uh, Gajpati has very significant Christian presence. And Gandamal, as you have seen, because of this kind of uh, rise in Christian presence, the kind of difficult situation that region ran into, we have already already seen. In fact, that happens all the time. I, uh, this uh, in that uh, Bratwara uh, higher part of this area, where I was referring to the Brat, uh, Maharashtra part of this belt, this Dhule, every day we are having problems. Akola, we are having every day we are a problem. Wherever, uh, and this is not unnatural. Wherever. 
a particular group is rising extraordinarily fast compared to others, in its numbers and hence in its power, the tensions will rise. There's nothing that can stop them from tension. Well, people have to be uh, nearly dead to not get into tensions on this kind of issues. Then below in South India, Kanyakumari, uh, Kerala we'll talk about later. Kanyakumari is in, in a way an extension of Kerala, where every, every decade Christian presence uh, becomes significantly more than the previous decade. And as those who have worked in Kanyakumari know, that uh, uh, keeping the sanctity of Kanyakumari temple is not easy. And uh, every, every year or every two, three years, Hindus try to put a uh, Hanuman, uh, the statue of Hanuman in the region, and they fail. They fail. That's the kind of uh, pressure that Indian religions are there in Kanyakumari. So this region one, Overall, there is an Indian dominance, but the clear pockets of, of worry and where Muslims or Christians have come to dominate. Uh, most of this I have told you. Now let's come to region 1, region 2, where I said the Muslim pres uh, presence is rising and uh, uh, Indian religionists are continuously under pressure. Almost everywhere in this region, Indian religions are below or around, below 85%. As we go eastwards, they are much below 85%. In Assam, they will be only 65%. In uh, uh, West Bengal, they will be only 74%. And uh, this is the whole region I have talked about. If we do not take the whole region, and this is a very important map. Please look at it carefully. Uh, if you don't take the whole region, start in East UP from somewhere like Bahraj, and go along the border through UP, through Bihar, through the contiguous parts of Jharkhand, Santal Pargana, part of Jharkhand, through the upper parts, northern parts of Bengal, and then pass through the Muslim nation of Bangladesh and into lower Assam. This whole belt, if you look at, the, here the kind of change that has occurred in the religious demography over the last 50 years after partition is unimaginable. These are the numbers. Total belt, they were in 51, less than 21%, 20.5% Muslims. In 2001, there are nearly 29% Muslims. In five decades of independent India, partitioned India, in this border belt, contiguous border belt, the presence of Muslims increased from 20% to nearly 30%. And that's not a small change. That's a very, very large change to happen before our eyes. And uh, I've also uh, given how in different parts of this belt things have changed. Let's now look at even a smaller part of this belt, uh, what I've shown as deep green area. So this has the Araria, Kishanganj, Katihar, Purnia, Sahibganj, uh, Purnia districts of uh, Bihar, then Sahibganj, Pakavad districts, which are part of Santhal Pargana of Jharkhand, then there is North Dinajpur, uh, South Dinajpur, Murshidabad, Malda, Bebum, this, this uh, uh, belt of uh, West Bengal. And then there is Dongai Gaon, Dhubri, Gwalpada, Kamrup, Barpeta. Uh, what was Darang, Kamrup, Nagaon districts of which have been separated into several districts of Assam? And the Kachar, Halakandi and uh, Karim Ganj. This is the area this belt covers. In this uh, belt, Muslims now form 46. In 2001, they formed. 46% of the population. And there are Christians there, uh, so the total, uh, certainly in, uh, in parts of Assam there are Christians. So in this belt, Hindus, Indian religions now, certainly were in a minority already in 2001. And uh, this is a belt on the border, show you this map to any, any person 
of a philosophical historical bent of mind and he will tell you that when this happens in any country on in a border region even very strong states will find it difficult to keep the integrity of that border area the integrity of that border itself and india certainly is not a strong state that very many districts as i have shown uh, in red they are already muslim majority and significantly muslim majority uh, dubri is 75% muslim murshidabad 64% muslim kishanganj is 68% muslim and i have gone to those borders uh, they are they are indefensible borders i'll talk to you about that sometime else then this uh, uh, region that i'm showing you of western up neighboring delhi this has uh, districts of saharanpur hardwar muzaffarnagar meerut bijnor muradabad rampur and bareilly this is the region which is the region of high muslims of india they they are the uh, great uh, rulers uh, of uh, of this uh, region and uh, uh, in fact the demand for partition came largely from this region and in this region uh, they were in 51 also they demanded partition but they didn't go perhaps they were kept there all kinds of films were making that how great india is that we kept them there but uh, in 1951 there were 30% muslims there now they are nearly 39% in 2001 Nine percent increase in this compact region, and people—I go and see those people. People know what is happening to them. It's not. It's, it's, this, these changes are visible on the ground. They are not only in the census data. They are certainly visible on the ground. They are visible in the lives of the people living there. Then this Kamau region, which should not have any Muslims, the hills hardly had any Muslims. There, this is Udampur and Nainital, that kind of region. the muslims are 4.5% they are at 10.10% in 2001 uh, let's wait for the 2011 data uh, this is uh, i'll we'll discuss this what has happened to uttaranchal bihar jharkhand now let's dis discuss assam in some detail assam is extremely important muslims were 15% in 1901 they are 31% in 2001 this is extraordinary and as i'll show you this is not the change is not in all of assam the change is in largely some distinct pockets of islam uh, of assam this change in assam was facilitated by the by the british was created by british people were brought this the idea was spread that assamese are indifferent cultivators this good land they know, don't know how to make the best use of it and they brought muslim cultivators from elsewhere gave them land settled them there so that was the cause of increase from 15% to nearly 25% in 41 and the next increase has happened now when people have not recognized the border they have continued to keep coming into what they thought was their natural living space as the bangladeshi uh, scholars keep saying that this the lebensraum is that what it's called of of the assam is the lebensraum of the bangladeshi muslims that's the colors of bangladesh claim and so they have not recognized the border and indian state has done nothing to protect the border so the assam has gone this way their uh, uh, christians have also increased from almost nothing to about 4% in 2001 Uh, let i'll just give you this figure in 1901 there were just about uh, 4 lakh about 5 lakh muslims in in assam and of this 5 lakhs 2 lakhs were in what is called lower assam this uh, by what which i mean gwalpara kamrup darang and nagaon districts of and about 3 lakhs were in kachar about 2.7 lakhs were in kachar and rest of assam had only about 1.5 lakhs muslims in 1951 the muslims had gone up from about 5 lakhs to nearly 20 lakhs and from these 20 lakhs 15 lakhs about 15 lakhs were in in those four districts of 
Assam. And Qatar had about 4 lakhs. And the rest of uh, Assam had about 1 lakh. In 2001, the number of Muslims from 5 lakhs of 1901 has gone to about 82 lakhs. And out of these 82 lakhs, 64 lakhs are in those four districts, undivided districts of Assam. Which means that in these four districts, number of Muslims from 1901 to 2001 has gone from 2 lakhs to 64 lakhs in one century. That is the kind of change which occurred. Uh, uh, Qatar has gone from 2 lakhs to 13 lakhs. And the rest of Assam from 1 lakh to 1.5 to 5 lakhs. So the Muslims who have come or have increased, they were all increased in this, these four districts of Assam. In these four districts of Assam. Uh, so, which means that in these four districts of Assam, they are such a majority that it is almost impossible for others to live there. And I'll, uh, this is a map of Assam Hall, where are the Muslims, where are the, as you can clearly see, this dark green. This is actually a talukwise map. And you can see this dark, uh, uh, deep green of Muslims dominating the, that part of Assam near the Brahmaputra and of course the Qatar part. As a consequence of this, uh, in Bongaigon, in Dhubri, Kokrajhar, Barpeta, Nalbadi, as I have given you the figures, during between 1991 and 2001, there was hardly any increase, it was all less than 10% of the Indian religionists, while Muslims everywhere rose by about 30%, and Christians increased, say, in uh, Dubri, Muslims increased by 30%, Christians increased by 66%, and Hindus increased by 5%. That's the kind of thing. And this growth of uh, less than 10% is not natural. This clearly implies that there are parts of this region from where Hindus have vacated, have left. And then I looked at the talukwise data, and these are the taluks. Uh, there's the Bhavragori, Dotoma, Bagribadi, Chapar, South Salmada, Bijli, Kalgachia, Bagbor. Between 1991 and 2001, each one of these taluks, the absolute number of Hindus had declined. Not the ratio, not the presence. Which meant that the Hindus had quit those areas in large number. And this data, I, when the 2001 census came, I showed this to several people that, look, there are these many taluks and perhaps there are more, where the Hindus are leaving the region. And it doesn't disturb us. If people are forced where they have lived for uh, their own region, they have come to a stage that they have to vacate. Uh, what are we doing about it? Well, it is not, I'm not saying the ratio went down. The actual numbers of Muslims' presence in Saluks came down. And there will be more now. In fact, they went recently to Assam. And uh, uh, in this region at least, in this region that we are talking about, I don't think it is possible for the Hindus to live. And Muslims want to move up towards the, towards the borderland parts of this region. And there, there is the fight. Because borders perhaps will not so easily allow themselves to be, to be washed out of that region as it has happened in the lower part. Uh, let me, uh, given the scale of time, let me quickly explain the third part. Uh, in the third part, the most important is Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, in Jammu and Kashmir, the situation is that uh, in Kashmir Valley, part of Jammu and Kashmir, there are no Indian religions left. There are really no Indian religions families left. In 2001, the census counted 1.5 lakh Indian religions there, out of which 50,000 were, were six. And amongst those 50,000, there were about 20,000 women. So those 20,000 can be said to be the Sikh families living there. Then there were 1 lakh Hindus. Amongst them, there were less than 10,000 women and hardly any children. So these 1 lakh are not families living there, the one like Hindus, they are the people who have been taken by the state of India there to serve various interests. Their, their employees there, they do not have space in the 
social fabric they do, do not have families there in in kashmir so whatever we think whatever we do it is clear that before our eyes within the last 20 30 years parts of india where hindus did have a possibility of living did have family life there did have place in social fabric of the place there they have been expelled there is no place in we can keep kashmir by military force but hindus have lost all space in the social fabric of the kashmir valley and the data shows that not only in kashmir valley all other parts of kashmir all other regions of kashmir also the muslim presence is rising fairly fast in kashmir valley of course they have become 100 percent more or less so that's one region which has gone out of us then kerala is the second major part of this and uh, in kerala uh, if you look at the figures in 1901 there were 69 percent indian religionists and in 2001 there were 56 percent 13 percent decline and this is shared half and half between christians and muslims uh, christians increased their share by about 6.5 percent in the first half of the 20th century Muslims increased their share by the same about 6.5 percent in the latter half of the 20th century. Loss was all of Indian religionists. If you look at the different regions of, uh, of uh, uh, Kerala, the lower regions, as you can see, uh, Thiruvananthapuram, Kolam, where the, uh, where the Christians dominate, there's not much change after, after independence. Uh, there's little change in Kota and Kochi region also. Palkat Trisur, which is the central region, there has been, Muslims have increased in the last 50 years, Christians have increased in the 50 years. The most major change in Malapuram, we chose to create Malapuram as a separate district in 1960. And since then, since then, uh, the presence of Indian religions there has become impossible. They were 47% in 1911, now they are less than 30%. And uh, the far upper region, Kojiru uh, Kod Karnur also, uh, Indian regions have come down from 74% to 58%. Kerala, lower Kerala has been taken over by the Christians, upper Kerala is dominated by the Muslims and everywhere Indian religions there live on sufferance and their numbers continuously keep coming down. Northeast is the last most important region that I will talk about and then we will conclude. Uh, Northeast, it looks to us as if we are taught as if it was always a Christian region. But as this data shows, in 1901, in the whole region, there was six point Northeast minus Assam is what I'm talking about. There were only six percent Muslim, six point six percent Muslim, mostly in Tirupura, and there were two point two percent Christians in the population. In 31, there were about 10 percent Christians counted in the whole region. In 41, census counted hardly any Christians there. Uh, this is the, uh, the way the census instructions were given. But 51, there were 22 percent and then every decade they have been rising, now they are 45 percent in this region. And they are 45 percent because there is still in Tirupura, which is relatively higher population, still the Christians have not been able to get much foothold and Manipur Valley which remains Vaishnava, which remains Hindu and relatively more populous there also the Christians have not been able to reach but the rest of Manipur the hill areas of Manipur it is perhaps 100 percent Christian Nagaland is nearly 100 percent Christian Mizoram is nearly 100 percent Christian Arunachal was uh, uh, let me see if I have the data for Arunachal Arunachal, as you can see, in 61, there were no Christians there. In up to 61, it was under military control. It was NEFA of India. When we set up a civil state there, from the next uh, census onwards, the Christian presence started increasing in Arunachal. So there were 81, there were 4 percent Christians, 91, there were 10 percent Christians, 2001, there were 19 percent Christians. If you, when the data comes for 2011, there will be certainly above 40 percent Christians in Arunachal Pradesh. Rest of Northeast was lost immediately after independence. 
this part of northeast which is being lost today after 71 everybody knows about it you go to northeast everybody tell you the commercials are being carried out there at the point of a gun the church comes and leaves pamphlets in the villages that by this date this village must come to the church and then the gunmen come and tell them why it is necessary to accept the dictate of the church it everybody knows about it it's happening in front of us uh, and the result is that Arunachal Pradesh uh, many districts already in 2001 there was 50 percent Christian it was 0 percent Christian in 71 but there will be many other districts which will find dominatable Christians in the current census uh, let me now uh, I wanted to talk about the world but we don't have time but let me summarize and conclude uh, what I am trying to bring out before you is that if you look at the whole of India we have lost about 12 percentage points in the in the population share of uh, the Indian religionists in the whole of India in about 120 years and this decline is so fast that another 20 30 years in this part of the whole of uh, uh, civilizational India Indian religionists will be a minority Muslims and Christians will be a majority and if you look at uh, the part of India which is left with us the Indian Union then we have this uh, this map should be always kept before us this whole belt is a belt where Indian religionists are in, under great pressure and the what is shown in the dark green and uh, dark red those parts are the parts where I think very soon Indian religions will find very difficult I think they are already in Kishanganj it's already very difficult in Bongaigong it's already very difficult in Dobri it's already very difficult in Arunachal it's already very difficult for the in Meghalaya it's already very difficult for those tribes who insist on remaining in fact every day we get news that Ramas this being done to Ramas that is being done to Rabas because they have not they have decided not to convert but Meghalaya every every day there is pressure on those who are there to convert there is pressure on uh, those who are left there in Arunachal Pradesh to convert every day so this part is gone out of the civilizational religious fold of India it is perhaps still kept within the fold of the Indian state but it's not easy to when some part goes out of the civilization fold to keep it within the uh, within the state fold is not easy then there are this uh, this is the larger picture where this all these red regions are outside but this is a graph this is a map I think we should uh, keep this in mind all the time you look at the north and uh, that north is all all green the Kashmir area is out of our reach then you see the the deep green of the western part of UP and that green keeps on going along the border with Nepal and becomes deeper green as we reach the eastern part as we reach uh, uh, Kishanganj and Araria part of and as you cross in fact that white which you see of Bangladesh is completely green and as you go into Assam you can see the lower part of Assam having turned almost entirely green and the the fringe is all red with the Christians uh, Arunachal which is looking somewhat less red will be much more red when we draw this map for 2011 uh, and that's the only part which is not looking red come below and you can see that belt extending from Ranchi to Sundargarh below uh, through Orissa to Fulbani uh, Ganjam Gajpati that red belt of Christians this is beginning much and much stronger and if instead of total population I had drawn this map which I have done for scheduled tribes then this belt will look even more more red then below on the west coast you see the lower part of uh, Kanyakumari becoming red lower part of Kerala is deep red and uh, the upper part of Kerala is fairly deep uh, green uh, and Malapuram is as you can see there clearly being seen as very deep green there and then you can see that belt in the central India starting from Burhanpur passing through Maratwada going up to Telangana and northern Karnataka 
uh, this is the situation of India. These maps are depressing, but they are presented to ensure that these maps do not become worse, they become better. And it is within us to be able to make this the situation better. And, but the time we don't have too much for this. I, uh, my feeling is 2011 uh, data is going to be even much more eye-opening than what it is, uh, what we see in 2001. Uh, I'm told that uh, it may not become available to us, the data of 2011, uh, very soon. Perhaps it will have to be we we'll have to wait till after the elections. But uh, in 2011, uh, from whatever little I know, both, especially the Christian presence and the Muslim presence are going to be much more than what they are. Uh, I end with the hope of all demographers, though I am not a demographer, that what I am showing you and what I am projecting to you does not remain or become the reality of India, that we change this reality, we change these projections and make it look different than what it is. Thank you.